This video will cover intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are forces between molecules. Generally, intermolecular forces are attractive between molecules. So for example, if we have molecule A and molecule B, the intermolecular forces between A and B will be attractive as we move A and B closer together, but only to a point. The intermolecular forces will be attractive until we start trying to push A into B's van der Waals radius. The van der Waals radius is basically the space that B and its electrons take up. Once we start to try to push A into B's van der Waals radius, the intermolecular forces between them become strongly repulsive. Intermolecular forces are particularly important in liquids and solids. Because in the liquid and the solid state, molecules are constantly in contact with one another. This is less important in the gas phase because the molecules are so spread out that they don't constantly contact one another. What this means then is that intermolecular forces are important to things like melting points, boiling points, and solubilities. And so by understanding intermolecular forces, we can use that knowledge to help predict uh, relative melting points, relative boiling points, and relative solubilities of organic molecules. Basically, the stronger the forces we have, the higher the melting point and the higher the boiling point we would expect. And intermolecular forces also affect solubility. Remember that like dissolves like. So now let's take a closer look at the three kinds of attractive forces that are considered intermolecular forces. The first intermolecular force that we'll discuss is called dipole-dipole forces. Dipole-dipole forces are attractive intermolecular forces resulting from the attraction of the positive and the negative ends of dipoles in polar molecules. Remember that when we talked about molecular dipole moments, polar molecules have a molecular dipole that has a positive end and a negative end. And the dipole-dipole forces that result from the attraction of the positive from one dipole attracting the negative of another dipole. So let's look at an example. Chloromethane is a polar molecule. The molecular dipole of chloromethane points in the direction of the chlorine and is fairly large for this molecule. So what we have here is a molecule that has a partial negative on the chlorine end and a partial positive on the hydrogen end. And if we have more than one chloromethane molecule, they can orient themselves so that their molecular dipoles line up that the negative end of one dipole attracts the positive end of another dipole in another molecule of chloromethane. The second intermolecular force that we will discuss is called London dispersion forces. London dispersion forces are attractive intermolecular forces that result from the attraction of the positive and negative ends of temporary dipoles in all molecules, not just polar molecules. This is different than the previous forces because we're talking about temporary dipoles, not permanent dipoles, and this is present in all molecules, not just polar molecules. In all molecules, electron, electrons are constantly moving around, creating partial positive or partial negative charges in portions of each molecule. When molecules are close enough together, a temporary dipole, a negative or a positive, can induce um, a similar dipole in a neighboring molecule and these are then attractive to one another. Because London dispersion forces depend on very close contact between molecules, it is proportional to the molecular surface area. A molecule with a greater surface area has more area with which to contact neighboring molecules, and therefore can have greater London dispersion forces. Let's look at an example. In this example, we'll compare carbon tetrachloride with chloroform. Let's look at the three-dimensional representations of these two molecules. Both of the carbons are sp3 hybridized, meaning that they're tetrahedral. The carbon tetrachloride has a larger surface area because having four chlorines, which are larger than hydrogen, takes up more space than having three chlorines and a hydrogen. And so since chloroform, CHCl3, has a smaller surface area than carbon tetrachloride, CCl4, carbon tetrachloride is going to have the stronger London dispersion forces. We would expect to see this play out in having higher boiling point and melting point for carbon tetrachloride, and this is in fact the case. The boiling point of carbon tetrachloride is 77 degrees Celsius, and the boiling point of chloroform is 62 degrees Celsius. 
keep in mind that this trend in boiling points can't be predicted using dipole-dipole forces, because if we calculate the overall molecular dipoles for these molecules, the molecular dipole of carbon tetrachloride is zero, while the molecular dipole for chloroform is small and pointing in the direction of the chlorines. So based on dipole-dipole forces, we would expect uh, chloroform to have higher boiling points. So clearly, there's something else uh, going on here, and that is London dispersion forces, which is predicted by the surface area of the molecule. Let's look at another example of this. Next, we'll look at some pentane isomers, and these are going to be constitutional isomers. Pentane has five carbons, and we can put those carbons all in a row, or we can increase the branching, for example, like this, or like this. As we increase the branching, the amount of surface area per total mass of the molecule goes down because the molecule is more compact. So for example, the structure on the left has the most surface area and the structure on the right with the most branching has the least surface area for the same mass because these are isomers and therefore have the same molecular formula. And so we would expect the structure on the left to have the strongest London dispersion forces and the structure on the right to have the weakest London dispersion forces, we can actually see this in the boiling points of these molecules. The structure on the left has the highest boiling point, it has the strongest intermolecular forces, which in this case are the London dispersion forces, and as we decrease the surface area, we see that the intermolecular forces decrease, and so does the boiling point. The last intermolecular force is hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is really a misnomer. We're not talking about bonds here. We are talking about intermolecular forces. Hydrogen bonding is a very strong intermolecular force. It's actually the strongest of the intermolecular forces. It is a very strong interaction between a hydrogen that is bonded to a very electronegative atom and the lone pair on another electronegative atom. It's actually a very specific case of a dipole-dipole interaction. Generally, what we mean by a very electronegative atom are uh, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. So the hydrogen has to be bonded to nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine, and the interaction is with a lone pair on another nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. So let's look at an example. Water is an example of a molecule that exhibits hydrogen bonding. Water has both hydrogen attached to a very electronegative atom, oxygen, and lone pairs on a very electronegative atom. And so we can have hydrogen bonding forming between the hydrogen on one molecule of oxygen and the lone pair on another molecule of oxygen. And so we say a hydrogen bond forms between the hydrogen on one water and the lone pair on another. Although again, remember that this is not a true bond. It is, in fact, an inter intermolecular force. Let's look at an example of how this can affect boiling point. We can see the effect that hydrogen bonding has on the boiling point of molecules by comparing ethanol and methyl ether. The main difference between these molecules is the ability for ethanol to form hydrogen bonding because it has both lone pairs on an electronegative atom and a hydrogen bonded to an electronegative atom. Methyl ether has lone pairs on an electronegative atom but it does not have hydrogens bonded to an electronegative atom, so it cannot form hydrogen bonds between molecules. And we can see this played out in the boiling point of these two molecules. The boiling point of ethanol is quite a bit higher than the boiling point of methyl ether.